Hi guys, so today I'm going to be coming to you with my full review of Lords of Hellas. I've been playing this a lot lately, so I've got a lot to talk about that I didn't really cover in my first unboxing, as well as how to play video. So I kind of want to talk about the whole game and what you really get in this game and uh, my overall thoughts, pros and cons, everything I liked, everything I didn't like. I'm going to talk about all of that. So uh, first I want to give you a little background on what generally appeals to me. I'm a big Star Wars gamer. I'm also a big uh, Ameritrash gamer. If it's got miniatures, if it's got sculpted pieces, upgraded components, I'm much more likely to be into it. Uh, so that's one of the things that drew me to this game initially. Uh, but I'm also, you know, I like multiplayer games. I like games that really get you interacting with other players. I'm not a big fan of games where everybody's just kind of playing their own game and at the end you add up victory points. So. Uh, uh, so this really works on a lot of levels for me. First, I want to talk about the theme. So this this theme is kind of ancient Greek meets cyber technology. So it's kind of an interesting like hybrid of genres, uh, but it works really well. And, it, and I think it feels thematic too, because a lot of the engine uh, based things that are going to happen during gameplay uh, make sense. You know, one thing is like you'll get a glory token that gives you more control in one region, but that only happens after you've done something important or heroic in that region. So that means like basically the people love you. And so, you know, it's very thematic in that aspect. But it's also very cool looking because you've got a fresh take on all these ancient Greek mythology and monsters and heroes. Uh, and they have like this upgraded electronic armor and it's just, it's very cool looking. So on that aspect, I really liked that. The art is beautiful. Um, you can just look at the box, the art all over this thing. The art is absolutely gorgeous. The artists who did this did a really stand up job. Uh, but the sculpts too, the miniatures are absolutely beautiful. Um, this game plays one through four players, so it's a good multiplayer, but it also has a solo variant, which is really important. And I know that's really important to a lot of people out there. I like that as well. And the solo variant is so detailed, it's not an afterthought. Some games will put a solo variant as an afterthought, but this solo version of this game is so detailed, the board flips over and it's a different board for the solo variant. As well as there are cards specific for the solo variant, there are separate components for the solo variant. There's an entire separate campaign book to walk you through the solo campaign. So the solo variant was a very detailed and very rewarding method of play as well. So it's definitely an integral part of the game. Uh, but the, the best experience I think is playing at four players because you're kind of getting the maximum gameplay playing with a full table. So, but a lot of games generally tend to be like that. Certain games have their sweet spots somewhere in the middle. I think this game has its sweet spot with four players. So let's talk about the components. This game has some really nice components. Uh, I'm going to start with the biggest ones first, and it's these amazing uh, monuments. These monuments are broken down into five pieces each, and they're built up on board during the game. So they start at level one, and you can build them up to level five. And the way that they've engineered these to all fit together like a statue that's actually under construction is really just magnificent. It works really well, and I absolutely love it love it. It looks beautiful on the game. A lot of people are really impressed by it too. It's one of those board games that people are going to walk by and say, wow, what is this? Uh, so that is great. The monsters are absolutely incredible. They're gorgeous. They're some of the finest sculpts I have seen. And that's saying a lot because I play a lot of a lot of board games with miniatures and a lot of miniatures games. So for a single mold sculpt, especially for a board game, this is really setting the bar pretty high. The heroes are great sculpts as well. Uh, but one thing that really surprised me was the individual armies. The individual armies you get didn't really need to be sculpted miniatures. Like I would have expected for most games to use meeples or little wooden cubes in place of these because you have a lot of them and they're all color coordinated. But here they gave them all sculpts and they're sculpted really well because these are kind of small minis. And there's a lot of effort that goes into making something that small look as good as they do. And they do look really good. And there are separate sculpts for every color for your hoplites and your priests. And that's something that I don't think they really even had to do. The colors are distinct enough to still help a lot of mildly colorblind people because they stand out from each other. You don't have like an orange and then a, then an orangey red and then a bright red and then a pink. You know, you've got very distinct colors, 
but they gave them all extra sculpts to make them completely unique in that aspect as well. There's no gameplay difference, but being able to look at a sculpt and be able to tell that that's a different army than the other one, it goes a long way for a lot of people, and I definitely uh, appreciate that extra attention to detail. But there's other components that are really good here. The cards look great. The, but the, the control tokens are sculpted out of plastic too. I'm a big fan of that because it's easier to move them around to pick them up. I just don't like too much cardboard and this game does have some cardboard components and that's okay, but when they upgrade some of the cardboard components to plastic components, that goes a long way for me because I really appreciate that and I like that a lot. If I had one criticism, it was that they upgraded some of the cardboard components to plastic components, but some of the other cardboard components are still cardboard, so if they were to ever do maybe like a deluxe version of this, it'd be nice to see all of the cardboard components gone and upgrade everything with deluxe. I mean, they, they, maybe that'll be like an optional buy if they ever do like another Kickstarter down the road. Um, and then maybe my only other criticism is as good as the insert is, and it's great, it's a really good insert, especially to fit all these miniatures, it can be a little tricky trying to get everything back into the box when you're done, just because of the fact that everything fits just so so perfectly that you're afraid that some of these gorgeous miniatures might get bent just a little bit, so it's caused people to try to come up with some creative solutions for it. I don't think it's that hard, and this is a really minor criticism, uh, and it's that you, these miniatures are so beautiful, you're just very, very careful about how you pack them so it can take a little extra time trying to pack them in just right so next I want to talk about the actual gameplay and different parts about gameplay so the setup isn't really that bad it takes a little while to set up but every game is gonna be a little bit different because of the some of the things that you've done uh, a lot of games are doing this randomized setup where the entire game is totally different every time you play and in some games are every game is the same every time you play and this one's a little bit in between those because while most games are going to be the same every time you play there's a few minor things that are going to vary from game to game and i think this is a comfortable medium for me uh certain games are so different that like like i'll take a game like dominion where every game you play is totally different i don't think any two people on the planet have ever played the same game of dominion twice so whereas here you know it's mostly the same and I like that your game is going to be mostly the same because it allows you to think some strategies so that the next time you come back to play it, uh, you, you can still apply those same strategies. Whereas if a game were totally different every time you played it, while that can be fun, especially if that maybe is the only game you own, you want it to be, you know, have some replayability. At a certain point, you also want to be able to plan a strategy and say, that was fun, let's play again. Oh, it's totally different. Now, because a lot of board games, especially if it's a game you're newer at, you're not gonna necessarily figure out your strategy or, or get a good feel for it until maybe halfway through the game and then you have a good idea of what's going on. And so for a game to you know, be mostly the same or have a lot, of, a lot of things in common from one game to the next, it can really help people wanna play it a second time and that's definitely one of the things that's I think a strength of this game. I also like the setup. Uh, one of the things that makes it different is, you know, your blessings and where your uh, basically the way temples are going to work, and that is cool. It also makes the Oracle of Delphi, which is a special temple, uh, it makes that different every time. But I also like that the setup mechanic of you get to place your starting units anywhere on the board you want. Uh, that definitely makes the game different because. You, you know, you don't have an assigned position to start. So you're actually making decisions from the very, very beginning of the game. And that's gonna impact all of the rest of the game. Maybe you start in an area that only takes two hoplites to control and you control a city right away. That's a good strategy. Maybe you wanna go for a, you know, a, one that, a, a bigger city and plan on not even having one right away, but hopefully gaining control of one within the first uh, with the first turn or two, you know, and then maybe that's a little bit more of a gamble. So it gives you ideas on things you want to do for your next game. So that's one thing that is uh, very interesting about about gameplay itself. The actions for this game are broken down into two different parts your regular actions and then your special actions and the regular actions aren't all that flashy at first although they make sense they're pretty standard things that you can do but it emphasizes leveling up the stats of your hero because the higher your leadership for example the more powerful your regular actions become and that can become almost as powerful as a special action uh, so it, it's a good way of making sure that all of the different stats for your hero are important and some are more important depending on which strategy or which win condition you're trying to go for. 
But the special actions have a really unique aspect of locking out a special action and by putting a token on it after you've used it to prevent you from doing the same action twice. That is a pretty cool mechanic. Some other games have done stuff like that, but this one does it slightly differently in that they have the build monument action wipes all of those off for everybody. So it becomes this interesting kind of cat and mouse game of, oh, I want to build a monument, but I don't want to let this dude fight a monster two times in a row. So I can't be the one to build the monument, even though I really want to build the monument. So, you know, it really adds a lot of clever decision making, a lot of strategy into this action system. So I really like the action system. The quests are another part of the gameplay that I'm just kind of lukewarm on. The quests are easy enough to do, but it doesn't seem like there's something that you really need to do. There are some cool parts to doing them, but it's not a victory condition. Quests don't directly help you win the game. So for me, they feel a little bit lukewarm. If they ever wanted to add maybe a fifth victory condition that somehow revolved around quests, then that would make quests feel a little bit more important because they're not bad, but but I feel like usually anytime you're doing a quest, there's probably something else you could be doing that's going to be a little bit more worthwhile than quests. Now, later in the game, once your stats are high enough that you can instantly complete quests, they become a little bit better. But whereas at the beginning of the game, all the other all the other things that you can do are more important, quests kind of are maybe the one slightly weak part of the gameplay. Uh, so. I'm kind of lukewarm on quests. Similar to quests, there are monsters, which are a much more engaging and entertaining part of the game. I really like the monster combat and combat as a whole. So monster combat is really cool because it uses these monster boards where you can mark the damage that you've done to a monster if you play the right symbol on your monster card. And there's multiple rounds of monster combat where it involves another player. And this is a thing that the game can do to reduce downtime for other players because when you're fighting a monster, the player to your left is going to basically take the control of the monster and, and draw cards from the monster deck and have the monster fight back at you. And so anybody who's fighting a monster is going to be engaging the player on their left as well. So that can kind of keeps everybody involved in what's going on. And that's another important thing is because downtime in these type of games can sometimes be uh, you know, a drag on the whole table if it's not your turn. So things like monster combat are a way to get other people involved even when it's not their turn. I like that. I also like the risk factor that goes into fighting monsters because maybe you don't actually fully kill a monster and now that monster is still on the board but it's wounded and another player can come along and kill it, get all the rewards for it, and monsters are a way to win the game. So, you know, all of these things are really important, but... I mean, monsters are very important because if you kill three monsters, that's one of the victory conditions. So it makes you think, well, you know, do I want to fight this monster? Maybe just get a trophy because you can sometimes get little small trophies from fighting a monster if you wound them a little bit which is also kind of thematic. Like maybe I chopped off the Minotaur's horn and I took an artifact from him, but I didn't fully kill him. But it was worth it because I got this Minotaur horn or something like that. So it is a little bit thematic with the monster combat as well. I like that. Um, but it's a definitely a game of give and take. Do I want to fight the monster? If I can't do it, maybe he'll wound me and then I'll have to heal afterwards. Uh, you play, your hero can't die, but your hero can get wounded and really kind of you know miss a turn or two trying to heal up. So there's a little bit of give and take there. Also, you don't want to leave a monster wounded for somebody else to come and take. So monster combat, very interesting. I like that the combat cards that you use for monster combat are also used in player versus player combat. And I also like that it's diceless combat. Basically, the cards are dual purpose. You're going to use one half for the, the top half for the monsters, the bottom half for players. That's very clever. I like the combat system of hoplites versus hoplites that you're just going to go back and forth, uh, potentially adding cards that add to your army value. And But in those are done... Um, you don't know what the other player's cards have. So in a certain part, it's secret, but then you, when you lay them down, it becomes not secret anymore, and there's risk associated with it because you can do wild attacks that are going to cost you, know, you cost your own army casualties even if you win. So sometimes you might have a Pyrrhic victory where you won the battle, but, oh, I only have one, one soldier left, so was it really worth it? And sometimes it's more important to just let somebody else have it. So I like the way combat works in this game, and I like that they're using the same cards for both types of combat. I think that's very clever, and I think it's an efficient use of resources.
There's also a couple of other types of rewards that you can get in this game. There are glory tokens that you get after you complete a quest or a monster, and glory tokens are very clever. Uh, they do a multitude of different things, but they can also allow you to do the special action of usurp, which you can go and kick everybody else out of a, out of a region, and you take control of that region, which is a very important thing to do, but you can only do it if your hero is there, and you have the same glory token that matches that region's color, so it's kind of restrictive, but when, you, when it all lines up and you can do it, it becomes very very, very powerful and can be a great way for you to stall somebody else who's about to win the game and you can slow them down. So it's very useful for that or it can also be very useful if somebody's trying to stall you from winning the game. Maybe that's incentive for you to go kill a monster or kill a quest or complete a quest even if you're not trying to do that. So I like the glory tokens. We do have two other things that seem kind of similar to me. You have artifacts, which are very powerful, and they're things that you can use. You basically kind of like a card that you'll tap or exhaust in order to use it. It gives you some kind of nice benefit. But you also have blessings. Blessings are done when people play temples on a, on a red temple placement, and that's going to change from game to game. Everybody will draft cards from the blessings deck, and blessings give you permanent buffs. And there's different categories of blessings, and it's going to depend on what type of gods and monuments you're using in the game. The basic this game comes with the three gods, so you're only going to be using the three blessing types in your deck, but as the game expands, you might add new blessings or new gods. That being said, I do think that blessings and artifacts are somewhat similar in how they're just basically a, a bonus for you or your army, and so they don't feel distinct enough from each other. There are differences where generally blessings are permanent passive bonuses and artifacts are activatable bonuses, but still at the same time, having the artifact available to be activated almost feels like a passive. Like, oh, but I can prevent two of my hoplites from dying, and so maybe no Nobody wants to go to war with me because they know that on that first battle I won't lose anybody. And so an artifact can sometimes almost behave like a passive buff because of the threat that it represents. So and the fact that every time somebody builds a temple it's also going to refresh all artifacts, or not builds a temple but rather builds a monument, it's going to refresh all the artifacts. It's you get to use them so much it, it, it feels similar. So sometimes if you have to make a choice, do I want to, you know, you don't really choose if you want a blessing or an artifact, but if you had to choose, they're both kind of about the same weight as far as the different benefits that they give you. Uh, and so I feel like that's, if I had another slight nitpick on this game, it would be that those two are a little similar and maybe they didn't need to be separate. Maybe it could have been, um, instead of getting an artifact, you just get a, a boost and it could have, they could have all been in the same deck. Uh, so that could have been a possible thing. But they're different card sizes, so you can't shuffle them into the same deck. And they're still good. They're still meaningful. And artifacts are great, and blessings are great, too. Sometimes you get one that doesn't really work with the strategy you're using, but sometimes you have to take one, especially when you're drafting the blessings, you kind of have to take one to stop the player to your left from getting it because maybe it works exactly with what that player is doing. So there's definitely strategy when it comes to the drafting mechanic as well, and I am a big fan of drafting. Uh, so it's not the drafting in secret though, because when you get a blessing, it's gonna be face up and it's gonna become public knowledge. So there's really not a whole lot of secrecy when you're drafting oh you can't see what I have well I'm about to give you the whole thing anyway so and everybody's gonna know what everybody got but I do like the blessings I do like the artifacts I just think that they're a little bit similar let's talk about victory because there are four victory conditions at least for most of the game if you're playing in only a two-player game though one of the victory conditions is not eligible so that's another reason why I think it's better to play with four players because you have the most versatility in a four-player game but let's start at the top the first way you can win is by controlling two lands in this game a land is basically an entire region of of the map that is color coded. Now the individual zones are called regions. The larger groups of like the four, you know, green regions are considered one land. So if you can control that whole land, that's halfway to victory. So if you control two whole lands, then you will win instantly. And that's another thing I like about this game is that there's no second place. You know, it's like one person wins, game over. And and then that kind of can help, especially if a game is going to drag on for a long time. When it's over, you don't have to stop and add up victory points and see who is going to win. When somebody wins, it's like, bam, they did it. Uh, the no next way is to control five temples. This is very similar to the other one in that it's still area control based in nature, but it's different because the lands you can see a little bit more clearly. Like, oh, this player is building up in the south and they're trying to control all of the lands down south. We need to, we need to try to go in there and stop them. 
But controlling five temples is a little bit trickier because temples are spread out throughout the entire map. So somebody might just have one here, one there, one there, one there, and you don't even notice that they have four, and then all of a sudden they move in and take their fifth temple. Surprise, game over. So the temples are a little bit of a trickier way to do it. So it forces you to look for different things as you're watching your other players play their turns. And it can also make you potentially change your strategy. But maybe you were going for controlling all the lands and you had three temples, but somebody you just can't, you can't take over Sparta, for example, because it's too heavily fortified. So then and maybe in secret, you make it look like you're still trying to take Sparta, but you do like a little Trojan horse and you ship some guys off to two other lands that have, uh, or regions that have temples, and then you surprise them win the game that way which is cool next way is monsters if you defeat three monsters you're going to win and now there's only seven monsters in the base game so being able to kill three monsters is tricky but the one thing that makes it a little bit easier is in most games not everybody's going for monsters uh strength is the hero stat that helps determine monster fighting ability a little bit better and so not everybody starts off with high strength. There is one hero that's going to start off. Hercules is going to start off with two strength as opposed to one. And so he's a little bit more suited to fight monsters. So if you play as Hercules, then maybe that's something that you'll do. And so the other players are less likely to level up their strength right away because maybe they don't want to fight monsters as much as you do. And if everybody is trying to fight monsters to stop, you know, the Hercules player from, from fighting monsters, well, then he can simply take advantage of that and do something else like perhaps take all the temples or or take over a couple of lands and when nobody else was paying attention so there's a, definitely a give and take for these different win conditions the fourth one is one of the most interesting ones and that is basically when you build a monument all the way up to level five and these are so cool but when you build a monument all the way up to level five you then get a special card that's going to do a three round countdown and at the end of the third round whoever controls the the region with that first fully built monument in it is going to win and therein lies a very cool aspect to the game because it can act as a clock or a timer if the game is like pushing back and forth and back and forth and nobody can seem to win well then just build a monument and cause a three round countdown to end the game so it's great that the game has a built-in timer there but the build monument action is the only action in the game that you can take every single turn because taking it wipes off all of the uh, the used action tokens off of everybody's boards not just yours but everybody's so you can build a monument every single turn and cause the game to end after your third turn or after your fourth turn if you just keep building a monument up and up and up and you can make it for a very short game the the downside to that is that if you're only you're, all you're doing is building monuments, you won't have recruited an army, so you won't be able to defend that monument, so you are guaranteed to lose. One minor nitpick is that can potentially allow somebody to troll your game a little bit and you know force the game to be very, very quick, which might be undesirable, but I think generally that's a small nitpick because typically when you sit down to play a game like this with, with uh, three other people, you generally know them or there's usually an understanding. Most board gamers aren't the type of people to do something like this. If this was an internet game when you were playing with complete strangers and there was anonymity, then there'd be a problem. But it, so it does potentially allow for you know somebody to rush the game. And that can, that can be a bonus too because maybe you've only got you know an hour to play and this game with four players can can take like two to three hours depending on player speed so maybe if you wanted to rush the game and have it be a little faster you could also do it that way as well my only other nitpick regarding gameplay is that in a four player game while that is generally the best and most crowded uh it can be hard to establish those important criteria of like controlling a couple of land and controlling cities so it is possible for maybe one player to kind of get left out of all the good lands and regions and not be able to do a whole lot so things like that can potentially happen but it's not very likely everybody's going to probably be able to do something because there's so many different things to do like you might find yourself oh i I couldn't I couldn't get any any temples or I couldn't get any of this other stuff you know what why don't I try and do some quests instead to help get me caught up and it does allow you to potentially come from behind and 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 surprise everybody especially with that fourth win condition
So final thoughts, what do I think about this game? I think this game is very close to being one of the best board games I may have ever played. I really like this game. I had originally backed it on Kickstarter at a just a base pledge, at a core pledge for the base game and regular stretch goals, but uh, now after playing it, uh, as soon as they open up the pledge manager, I'm basically gonna go all in because I want everything for this game. I have some concerns because of how crowded the board gets in a four player game to expand it up to six players, which some of the expansions will let you do. It makes me wonder about how long that would take because with so many victory conditions, it can lead to some analysis paralysis for very competitive players. And if you, multi you increase that to six players, it could make your game take a little while. But I'm totally willing to test that out because it's so much fun during the game. And there is different things that are going to involve people across the table, such as monster combat and card drafting, things that will get everybody involved. So there's not that much downtime. And that's really one of my, you know, the potential downtime and the potential, um, you know, bad experience for a crowded game is very minimal, but it's there. But that being said, everything else about this game is firing on all cylinders so the artwork is beautiful the components are beautiful the fun factor is out of this world with so many different things that you can do and I love that you're not just locked into a single path to victory that's one of my favorite parts but overall the fun factor here is just great because every time I play this game as soon as we're done I want to set it up and play again and that's a really a good way to tell how, how much fun a game is. If you're instantly thinking, oh, I want to play again, but I want to do something different. Oh, I want to try this again because I want to do that different. Oh, I want to try this strategy. Oh, I want to try and rush the monument this time. Things like that. So that is a really, really great part of this game. But then the other thing is, even if you lose, you can still have a great time. That's probably my number one requirement for a board game is that even if you're going to lose, are you going to talk about this game afterwards? Are you going to say, oh, yeah, yeah, but I did that. Remember when I stole that Cyclops out from under you? That was awesome. So there's still almost like achievement unlocked. If you do something really cool in this game, it makes you feel great, even if you don't win. And that's one of my most important things of any board game. So I love that this game has that. So all in all, A plus from me. Absolutely love this game. Uh, I, I, if you haven't played it yet, I really hope you get your copy. I, hope, I can't wait for it to hit retail so everybody can play this game. It's definitely one of the best games of the year. Uh, it's probably going to be in my top five of all time. I want to thank you guys so much for watching. And I have news. I have an announcement. So we have a Siege Storm giveaway winner. And that winner is Alkaline Divide. You have just won Siege Storm. So make sure you message me on YouTube and I will get your contact information and I'll get that sent out to you as soon as possible. I want to thank everybody so much who uh, entered to win the Siege Storm giveaway. I want to thank you guys for watching this. I hope you like this game. I'm going to be doing more board game reviews as well as more Star Wars reviews and more Star Wars gaming articles. All of that good stuff is coming, so make sure you are subscribed. Click the bell for alerts. I have giveaways going on all the time, so check those out as well. I want to thank you guys so much for watching, and have a great day.